what were some of the things that you were looking for? Uh, I would say probably at a minimum, uh, excitement about the trade, being excited about sharing that knowledge, uh, excited about where that trade is headed. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast, our regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is Fine Home Building contributing editor and production manager at TDS Custom Construction, Ian Schwant. Today, I am joined by Joe Garvilla, owner of Cypress Construction in Laurel, Delaware. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast and the original Fine Home Building podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. Joe, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, glad to be here. So Joe, you, uh, like many of our guests, have a pretty varied background. Uh, give us an overview of the path you traveled to get to a uh, construction company owner. Sure. Uh, probably started formatively around uh, 1997. I was three years old and my parents had a, a full gut remodel of their house in uh, Georgetown. And uh, I remember Mickey Payne was a builder and he was mixing up some uh, drywall mud. And you know, he was telling me, uh, oh, yeah, it's the mud I got out back. So, you know, little little me, I uh, <laughs> thought that was really interesting. Uh, <laughs> and then we'll jump ahead right to shop class in high school. Uh, I had a really energetic uh, experienced shop teacher, uh, two of them actually, uh, Gary Stewart and Bruce Hefty. And, uh, you know, they really ignited the actual passion for the trade, you know, that may be interested in it. Then, uh, then, you know, like a regular kid that goes to college, I had a couple of jobs here and there. And one summer was on a framing crew and, uh, they did nice custom homes. So I had a good exposure there. And then, uh, on from there, um, uh, I worked for Denrec for a little bit in the fisheries office. So that was more of a scientific setting. Uh, then finished college. And uh, I don't want to lead too far into the questions, but uh, <laughs> not not long after, I went into business and uh, had a few other stops from there between there and then and now. So, <laughs> How did those early experiences like working for the, the Denrec, which is, uh, can you explain what that is to people? But uh, sure. how did working for those government entities like that inform your approach to construction? Uh, sure. So Denrec is the Delaware Natural Resources and, uh, oh, Lord, now you don't get me messed up. Uh, ecological conservation, something along those lines. Environmental conservation, there we go. Uh, so what I did there was uh, fisheries research. So we go out on vessel, collect fish, do scientific things, uh, like collecting data or lists. Uh, things like that. We did an aquaculture survey, and the whole point of all that is it got me into methodologies. It got me into, uh, you know, sort of like a research assistant. Um, so it gave me that type of discipline to really thoroughly investigate subjects, uh, which certainly informed, uh, you know, when I bought my first IRC, the 2018 IRC book, uh, <laughs> I, got, I got a little bit nerdy with it. Uh, <laughs> just at the uh, Mid Atlantic Building Science Symposium. I was talking to Glenn Matthewson. I was quoting Chapter Ten. He's like, "You know Chapter 10? I was like, <laughs> 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 "So you know, it was, uh, yeah, that, that informed that part of it." Um, yeah, without going too far, I, I you yeah, know did work at a community college for a bit, and having started a business young, I didn't have a whole lot of control processes in place. And if there's one thing government has, it's plenty of control <laughs> processes. Uh, so I'd say that's another one. That's another one that informed my approach to construction. So when we were talking beforehand uh, via email, you mentioned that you accidentally started your construction business. You got to got to give the listeners the background on how one accidentally starts a construction company. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in, in some ways, my introduction to self-employment started out as side work, right? You know, handyman yeah. services here and there. Uh, and then I got a call uh, with another contractor I worked with. His work he didn't want. And uh, what it was is the level of floor because there's a soft spot. It's an old house from, I don't know, 50s or 60s. So I did there. I crawled underneath the, you know, through the crawl space, you know, all the sprickets and the cobwebs, get up to the front. And uh, I looked up and sure enough, there's a soft spot and I see a bunch of mud all around the joists. And so I follow the mud to the sill 
and from the sill to the ground, and uh, it's a bunch of termite damage. And as I look down the whole front elevation of the house, every single joist is just crushed on the bearing ends from wait, oh, damage. And at that point, I said, huh, if I'm going to lift this guy's house, I should probably go ahead and get insurance <laughs> and get a license. <laughs> That's so, better than uh, most. I think, I think most people would look at that and think, <laughs> ah, I, can, I can do that. I'll just go to Home Depot right now and get some stuff. I'll just jack it up, put some new new joists in. But you had that government experience letting you know about liability and systems and getting yeah. your house in order before you do that, right? And some of that and some of uh, – I, I did get an associate's in general business. Uh, it, it hasn't helped nearly as much as I thought it would. But <laughs> I mean, it pointed me in the right direction, I guess. <laughs> so, so what, what did you the, learn in those first first few years of business you know what are some things that went well and some things that didn't go well and other uh things that you had to learn on the fly yeah there's a lot uh namely how much i don't know uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's see uh it, 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 i didn't know anything about really managing employees uh, you know that first job i hired on the first guy kind of Waning it, um, you know, paid a payroll company to handle all that part. And I just had to make sure there's money in the bank to keep them paid. And so, uh, yeah, almost everything I learned was on the fly, um, which is not the greatest way to do it, honestly. Uh, there's definitely a lot of stumbling blocks that you come across. Um, I know, speaking from my state in Delaware, there's not a clear path, uh, regulatory wise, to tell you all the things you need to know and taxes you got to pay and certificates you need to have. and so it's usually, uh, you know, I get through a year, then I find out all the things I, I didn't know about and have to pay for them. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, and then hardships, you know, taking any job you can when you start out. Obviously, I'm, I was young and dumb, still, you know, still learning as it is. But, uh, you know, I didn't vet certain clients as thoroughly as I should have. Um, you know, and then once you start to play catch up, sometimes you take risks that you shouldn't. I had a 14-yard concrete pour that, I'm experienced in concrete. I thought the two guys working with me could handle it. And, uh, you know, the next day I was there with a tripping hammer and busted it all out. We <laughs> lost the, the whole slab. So, you know, you learn the hard way sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I remembered my first experience in having to have a workers comp audit and uh, the person called me on the phone to schedule the audit. And she said, well, you know, make, make sure you have your general ledger and all of your, uh, your account <laughs> books there. So straight to Google, general ledger. What, 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 am I, what do I need to cook <laughs> up to show this person? What records do I need? But yeah, you, you don't know what you don't know until someone I don't know, comes in and says, you, you need this because of some regulation or you need this for insurance. Uh, you know, do you have any of that kind of stuff too, or was it more? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I'm, losing I'm a slab here and there. Uh, you know, when I, last year when I worked for the college, uh, completely missed the the letter for the payroll audit, and so here I am paying <laughs> the, uh, the 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 uh, penalty rate now for. <laughs> it's what happens. I mean, it's it should, yeah. but lessons learned, right? Uh, right. Yeah. There's, there's a whole cottage industry of books that try and teach the, uh, the doer how to be the owner of a company. And it, even though there's so many of them out there, I think people like us miss an awful lot when we, you know, take on that self-employed lifestyle and go out on our own and, and turn those side jobs into real jobs. It's funny you bring it up. I, you know, haven't listened to the podcast over the last year. I have the whole FHB, like, book list you know so that's uh you know nail your numbers now uh, mark up and profit uh all this <laughs> yeah you <laughs> can add the e-myth really to that one <laughs> so uh, what, what kind of practical business knowledge do you think tradespeople need to get a grasp of before doing what we were just talking about and turning those side jobs into real jobs and you know do you think learning under fire is the best way tradespeople like us end up end up learning are those mistakes worth it in the end um no no there's some <laughs> things you can uh, <laughs> learning under fire is great as an employee uh it, it, you know you can make some mistakes and you don't have to pay for them typically um i'd say if you're gonna jump out on your own that's that's a big jump um you need to know some accounting principles uh you need to know how to research your codes i mean i i've 
self-taught myself a lot about design and uh, compliance just just from diving into the IRC and then the ASTMs and ACE and all the different standards out there. Uh, I'm trying to down a list here. I, I, a big one for me is uh, like contract law uh, and just basically how to look over a contract that also extends into some regulatory language. So, um, you know, my state, there's probably about six different agencies that in some way wow. relate to building construction. And you got to be able to look through those codes and have an idea of how to interpret them. Um, and then probably the last one, you know, a, a real big miss, and I think you and I can relate to it, is, is workflow management. Uh, I, I don't quite say project management because if, you know, if you're a hands-on carpenter, you know what the project needs. It's everything else that can build up and you don't account for that when you're trying to estimate your time as the owner. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, you put too much on yourself and things start to slip. Yeah, those are those general requirement things that can really screw up the ability to make money on a project, right? Like forgetting that you need to provide a portage on for everybody on the site or, you know, some, some little $400 a month thing that just starts yep. to add up on you. Oh, you got so you it. mentioned your your time at the community college. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you did there as a director of tech ed, and just in general, where do you see the the trade education heading? Sure, uh, I'll, I'll break it up in two parts. So the the first bit, uh, why I even took the job, is uh, a little bit of the result of COVID. Um, you know, obviously, when most contractors are slammed at work, I was no exception. Uh, but at the same time. Uh, there's a lot of money going into trades education because of the pandemic. Um, uh, one, is, it's not a building trade, but health professions. Uh, we had something called Executive Order uh, 40, you know, 43. Yeah, Executive Order 43 gave us a huge chunk of money to train uh, National Guardsmen and women. Uh, their, their CNAs, their phlebotomy stuff. Uh, and then on the building side, we got a huge chunk of money to, to bolster our trades education. So... That leads me into the next part that, um, you know, there is a bunch of money, at least for our state, being thrown at trades education. Now the problem is, is building a program out of it. Um, you know, so carpentry in this state, I mean, you know, unless you're with a union, it's, it's not an apprenticeable trade right now. Um, so there's little incentive to practically take uh, trades education beyond a high school shop class here. And yet we're still trying to stand this program up. So... Uh, the other part is creating a trades program that um, really helps the local need. A lot of what we use is NCCER, which is, it's good, it's baseline, uh, but it's often not specific enough to our industry. Um, one problem, I, I graduated in 2012 from high school. Shortly after I graduated, they changed the whole shop program to a construction management program. So a lot less hands-on. <laughs> And my thought was, you know, if I'm a contractor, I need an employee. I need someone that knows how to do the work, not a, not a manager. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I felt like they're jumping the gun by teaching teenagers uh, management without teaching them the trade. Now, again, fortunately, in the last couple of years, uh, Sussex Tech High School nearby, they've really, really reinvigorated their, their trades education. So they've uh, brought back welding. They've you know, bolstered their carpentry programs and their diesel programs, electrical programs. And it's also the same spot right now that does the night school for the apprenticeable trades, like the HVAC and electricians. Um, the community college I worked at, we're, we're just getting into the apprenticeable trades education. Uh, so that's just beginning. But there's a lot of red tape, and that's probably the biggest holdback <laughs> on uh, making a successful program. You know, we got the program stood up, but we didn't quite have the flow to, to deliver what we wanted to deliver to the students. So yeah, it's a work in progress. And what, what kind of red tape do you have to go through when you set a program like that up? I've, I've talked to many people, not just on this podcast, but other people that have written into the main show or uh, just people that I meet from being in the trades that want to do something like this. They want to have, even if it's not a full government back mm -hmm. apprenticeship program as as most of those programs are uh, you know where where do you start where do you start with building a program and determining the skills that people need 
Sure. Uh, so Delaware Tech, the community college I work for, they, they do have a little bit of freedom on the programming itself. Uh, because we're a self-funded model, as long as we have the enrollment, we can pretty much deliver what we want. As soon as we go into the apprenticeship realm, now we need to register with the Department of Labor for the state of Delaware. So they have DOL involved. Uh, it is technically higher education as a as a, uh, underneath the umbrella Department of Education for the state. Uh, so there's a few things like that as soon as you mention the apprenticeship. Um, the other red tape is just the uh, the purchasing process. You know, it takes six weeks to turn a purchase order around, and we need a purchase order for anything that's over about $2,500. And that doesn't go very far <laughs> in a trade program. <laughs> it's not a lot so, of studs in OSB for yeah. a couple of students, right? <laughs> So that's you know one of the large barriers, and then last one, it's finding educators. Uh, you know, there is one unique. Well, I shouldn't say it's unique, but one problem we had is when we put a listing out. You know, we we're not allowed to strip the requirement that you need a bachelor's degree. Right. Not a lot of trades guys are coming in with a bachelor's degree to teach carpentry. Uh, we do have a workaround, but we're not allowed to say we have a workaround. So there's all this <laughs> shuffling yep. around of words and. Yeah, one of one of the the regrets that I have with my education is that I I knew at the time when I finished my apprenticeship program through the Carpenters Union that I could have done I think it was a year and a half and had it turned into a bachelor's degree, and it just you know twenty four year old me was like more school forget that I get on the field and make money, and now I, I kind of wish I would have taken advantage of that because I, I think my my statute of limitations for that. Uh, getting me in is long gone now, but uh, what, when you uh, have somebody that wants to come in and teach, but they need the bachelor's degree, uh, you said that there were workarounds for that. I mean, how I got to think most of the people that apply for those positions are people like me who did an apprenticeship themselves or owned a construction company. You know, what can you do for the people like that that want to? be involved in education. Sure. So um, the, the one workaround we had was uh, basically we have every six months you have to fill out uh, basically a form that says we can't find someone with a bachelor's. So we need the campus director to approve this guy to, you know, or girl to be hired on right. to do this teaching. Um, so there's a little, there's just an extra step in paperwork there that you have to redo it every six months to a year. Um, which, you know, once you have a good instructor, it's, it's, it's kind of rubber stamped after the, after the first hire, sure. uh, but even the HR department, and it's, and it's not their fault. Um, it's, they have to follow the federal regulations. If an instructor hasn't taught in six months, he has to like, redo their I-9s. You know, right. it's, it's really difficult to be an instructor because the pay tops out at $37 an hour, and you're only paid when you're teaching. So yeah. that's the flip side to it is it's hard to get an electrician or an HVAC guy in there because... <laughs> I mean, come on, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of responsibility for not much pay. <laughs> right. What, what are some things that make a, a tradesperson a good teacher at the uh, tech ed community college level? What are, what were some of the things that you were looking for? Uh, I would say probably at a minimum, uh, excitement about the trade, being excited about sharing that knowledge, uh, excited about where that trade is headed. Uh, John or HVAC guy, you know, he's a real, he's pretty, he's passionate about the trade and passionate about the training. Um, you know, he had a few snafus with his payroll and he stuck it out because he cares about the students. Um, I'm friends with the, with the guy that runs the adult ed program at Sussex Tech. It's just the same thing. These guys just want to see this next couple of generations gain this knowledge and experience. So as a contractor now, are you looking to those tech ed programs for employees for yourself? Uh, I, I might poach one or two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do. I, I don't turn that much work. I need that much help. But uh, certainly we do invite uh, private contractors in to talk to the classes. Uh, Sussex Tech does a banquet every year with, with all their uh, DOL sponsored employers. Um, you know, that's a real great networking opportunity. So it, it does, if you become part of one of these apprentice programs, uh, your employment is almost guaranteed as, as long as you're willing to show up and do a good job. So does the 
tech school have sort of uh, some kind of relationship with contractors that you have a preferred grouping of people that you're sending some of these uh, graduates to that you know are going to be stable enough to provide them with work and and want to take somebody who's learned the minimum that you need to be able to do the trade within a, a tech college environment and help them move on to the next level. So I, I can't imagine that the the idea is that you come out of this program a, a fully fledged tradesperson. You've got that kind of base level experience, right? Exactly. So the I would say that the differentiation between what the college is doing and the adult education program is doing at the high school is the college program gave you six months of relatively intense training. Um, so you're fairly, fairly competent, you know, it's a step above labor, right? Um, the, the high school, the adult education there, what's nice about it is, you know, you only do 144 hours of training a year, typically in the winters, two days a week, two nights a week. Um, but those people have to be in the field of construction or in the field that they're being apprenticed in. So the benefit there is you get your, your book knowledge at the school while you apply that practically during the day. And there's there's two different types of contractors there. There's there's the large ones that do uh, commercial industrial scale electric, and they're they take a big proportion just because they're large. Right. And then you have your good quality contractors that really come in and try and look for a more best fit for their company values type of uh, student. So yeah, it works works. You know, two different ways there. Do the students have an opportunity to go work for any of these contractors throughout the program as they progress? Do they do any internships or working days? So for the college program, that, that wasn't um, set up yet. And now that program is still being fleshed out. So I'd like to see that be part of it in the future. Um, from other pro talks, I've heard other programs actually go out and build homes. Uh, I think there's yep. one in Ohio or Indiana. And I was like, wow, yep. I wish we could do that. You know, that's... <laughs> But but we're you know we're stuck building sheds and model walls and which is fine. I mean it's a start, but yeah. So now you you left the position when you decided to uh, restart your business pursuits, right? So mm -hmm. you did you have to find your own uh, person to leave it, and make sure it was left in good hands with with somebody else. Uh, yeah. If he listens to the podcast, I don't know if he. Uh, <laughs> still likes me or not, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it worked out that, uh, uh, he's a good friend of mine, uh, Anthony Carmen took that position over. And, and, uh, two reasons I left was I, I don't have a bachelor's anyway. I would have had to finish that to stay. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't a good fit. Right. I mean, can you imagine going from self-employment to yeah. government agency? Um, he already had a doctorate in education, uh, cause he's, he was already a teacher for 17 years at Sussex tech. And so him coming in, he's better suited for it. He has the knowledge, the experience with the state. Um, you know, he can do a, so much more of that program than I could have. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's in great hands in that regard. Yeah. It had to be a difficult decision to, uh, return to the, the grind of never ending work that is being a self-employed contractor. Right. Uh, I much prefer it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I basically gave up all executive function when I went back to the school. So at least I yeah. can make all my decisions again. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. And then the self-employed lifestyle, you're the only one you have to answer to a lot of times. So for better for worse. Yeah. <laughs> but so you've, you have another pursuit that's uh, come out of all of this. Uh, you're doing some work to lobby your state to get uh, regulations either set or changed to, uh, Tell us a little bit about that. That of all the things you've got going on, that seems to me the one that I can't wrap my head around. Yeah. So when we talked back a few questions ago about uh, you know workload management, uh, I'm I'm clearly not good with that yet. I'm still <laughs> learning. Uh, <laughs> no, th this come out of passion, and and I'm hoping to get more people involved. That I am not the sole person uh, leading this charge, and and admittedly, it's it's just getting started. Uh, I just I just opened up the LLC. Um, at the beginning of the year. And I had to do that because I, I cannot be a non-for-profit if I'm lobbying. These are all those right. regulations you get to, to right. read about. Uh, the idea is 
to to make a, a centralized place for contractors and homeowners to work together to create better consumer protections, but at the same time increase protections for contractors. Um, you know, this state it's seventy five dollars for a business license and uh, a minimum of another three hundred dollars for a contractor registration, which basically is proof of insurance, proof of workers' yeah. comp if you have employees. Uh, there's nothing talking about whether you know the code, whether you know the regulation, and certainly no guarantee of competency. So I'd like to see something like a professional regulation board, not so dissimilar from the Maryland MHIC board, which is the Maryland Home Improvement Contractor Board. Um, you know, they set the regulations about you know standard practices, contract practices. Um, they also have a board that can review disputes without necessarily having to file a separate small claims court mm. Uh, issue, which you know, costs a lot of money. Um, another piece of that for the homeowners is a guarantor fund. So, you know, if a homeowner has been wronged by a contractor, the contractor could be reprimanded for it. But there's a chunk of money available to uh, give to that homeowner to correct hmm. those damages. Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of different things, right? And uh, you know, some people before against various things, but I'm pulling inspiration from around the country to try and. Uh, the stand up something that's better than what we got. <laughs> so when you say contractors, are you thinking specifically general contractors or more carpentry, basement trade kind of contractors? I, I gotta assume there's some level of that regulation already for the mechanical trades. Exactly. So this wouldn't touch mechanical trades. Uh, that's kind of the same deal with the MHIC board. If you already have a regulating body, it stops there. Um, so this would catch. Like you said, the general contractors, maybe some specialty contractors like your drywall painters. Um, and, and it really, uh, like if you look at Maryland's model, it didn't really add anything to the to the financial burden per year to the contractor. There was a little bit of paperwork headache, but yeah, not more than an afternoon's worth. Uh, Maryland does do a, an exam uh, proctored by a third party, uh, and that really covers again the regulation. You know it. it reminds the contractor, you, you know, to be enforceable, you need to have, uh, you know, a, a, I'm not sure if the numbers wrong, but so many days to revoke that contract, you know, permission to revoke and longer for elderly people. Uh, you can't accept more than X amount down. You know, it's, you know, if, if you follow it, it levels the playing field, it makes you look more professional. Um, again, it protects both parties, so. All right, you got to be able to walk into a room and recite chapter 10 of the IRC on command. <laughs> no, you know not quite. Right. <laughs> no, like the electrical exams. I, I reckon it'd be open book. So, <laughs> yeah. But that's what you're looking for is something that applies that knowledge of the, the various building codes into uh, somebody's repertoire in a way that is, you didn't say licensed, but at, at the very least verifiable to the person who wants to hire them. Sure. And I realize trades uh, can be vastly different. So I don't necessarily mean to pigeonhole any one spot, but just a, a general understanding of, of best practices, uh, at least in terms of contracting with homeowners um, and, and to some extent renters. Yeah, that's kind of another aside is, um, you know, if you have a bad tenant or excuse me, a bad landlord mm -hmm. who's hired a contractor that's done something wrong, well, maybe the landlord doesn't care, but the renter has to live with that potentially dangerous right job you know so what recourse do they have so, yeah, in, a, uh, in that case a, a landlord may have absolutely no idea of who they even hired if it's a out-of-state landlord or right somebody who's not involved in the day-to-day -day management of the uh, of the units right yep exactly so, so, like I, said, I don't know where to start a land but <laughs> where did you get the idea to even start going down this road uh, well, I just looked at some of the local agencies and didn't see anything like it. So I just decided to do it myself. And are you focused uh, mostly on the Delaware state level or are you going to be one of those suits walking around D.C. someday uh, meeting uh, with I, I some of the staff? <laughs> that, that doesn't suit me well. I, I had to find a clean shirt just to put this on here. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, stri- strictly the state level. Uh, I I can barely handle what I got going on, let alone <laughs> mess it up in federal scale. <laughs> well, you made the comment about education being you know focused on on bettering the local work environment. So this does kind of go hand in hand with that, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and certainly. Um, <laughs> uh, one thing is I couldn't work with the college and advocate for more education, right? That might be a conflict of interest. Uh, <laughs> but but I believe yeah. it makes everyone better. It, it elevates everyone for everyone to get better. Uh, and, you know, I, I hear all the time that, you know, the, the most experienced tradespeople are aging out of the workforce. It might not hurt to have a little bit of a, yeah, I don't know what the right word is here, but some sort of bar to shoot for at a minimum entry level to kind of bridge some of those gaps. Yeah. Believe it or not, there's a lot of opportunity in what people like us do on a daily basis in the the construction world, even if we are in the kind of small time residential end of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And and your state uh, has continuing education, right? Yep. Yeah. So that's uh, how awesome would that be to have 10 hours of that a year or something? I mean, it's, we have nothing like that. Yeah, and at the very least, it makes you you put in some professional development work over mm-hmm. the course of a, a year, a couple of years to stay in business, right? Yeah. So you got to tell us about your own house. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you <laughs> find some time to work on that every once in a while between teaching, lobbying, and working on other people's houses. Uh, oh. you know, what kind of kind of projects have you done to it, or dream of doing to it i i definitely picked this corner of the house it's the only (laughs) one finished except for that you know roller stain on the ceiling there Uh, (laughs) but this house is never ending projects uh it's built in the 40s uh actually was decently framed that that part i'm impressed with uh but i have a very ambitious wife um who she owns that she bought the house before we got together and one of the first things she did was tear down the load bearing wall right underneath the air handler. So, nice. <laughs> yeah, my first project was, uh, you know, cutting the, the ceiling joist out and making a bean pocket and putting an LVL up in the <laughs> middle of the kitchen. But yeah, it's a, it's a never ending project. My latest one is slowly going around the house, stripping all the asbestos off. Um, fortunately the wood lap siding looks pretty good. I might try and, and hang on to it. Uh, although, nice. It's got to be leaky as a sieve. I, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't bothered putting a blower door on it yet, uh, especially not with a wood stove and <laughs> all sorts. Yeah, of we stuff. didn't, we didn't even get into building science, but that's also something <laughs> that you're, you're developing an interest in, isn't it? Oh, uh, certainly, uh, at least by proxy, right? I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, there, there's, the list is too long, but I, I'll yeah, probably I work that... on it until I die. I think that's the way most of us feel. I my house is new as of two years ago, and I feel like I'm just going to keep knocking little bits and pieces off of it and <laughs> changing room layouts. Uh, you know, waking up and realizing we laid out the bedroom wrong, but if we take down <laughs> that wall, it'll be a little bit better, and we could, you know, put an elliptical in there or something and have a workout <laughs> room. Uh, so Joe, it's been it's been great having you on. Is there anything else that you want to tell or ask the audience before we sign off? Uh, if you're interested in teaching trades, go find your local uh, trades education space, whether it's public, private, what have you. Uh, and probably the last comment is, you know, don't stop learning. You know, there's more information out there than we can ever know. So if you're bored of what you're doing, you're just not looking hard enough. Uh, it's great perspective. Joe, thanks for taking the time to join me today. Thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. Please like, comment, or review us wherever you're listening. Helps others find the podcast. Thanks again, Joe, and thank you all for listening.